I thrust my arm in a fit of rage towards a shop front window. When I pulled my arm back out and a large shard of glass got caught on my elbow, cut it in half. Welcome back to the Hustlers Podcast. Today we have a very special guest, our second guest on the podcast. We have Glenn Manton, former AFL player for Carlton and Essendon, turned author and public speaker. Wow, that's quite an introduction. I'm impressed with your research, but you missed a lot out too. An awful lot. Father of three. three. Bob Sledder. Mm -hmm. Media personality. Media personality. Bike rider. Bike rider. Because that's how I got here today. I rode a vintage Peugeot bike here in Lycra (laughs) to be with you two. Hustlers. Hey, hustlers. I like it. That is dedication. Don't you worry about that. Talk to me, gentlemen. We've got a limited amount of time. COVID virus is spreading between us as we speak. Well, we're not. We know we're not 1.5. We're we're all right. We'll be okay. We've all checked our temperatures. We're fine. Talk to me. Let's get into it. Hustlers podcast would suggest to me that the two of you are going to put me under the pump. Hold me to the fire. Yes. Burn my face. We will. We will. That's, that's well, the goal. Well, fucking get on yeah. with it. Okay. I'm going to be honest. Glenn came to my school <laughs> how long ago? Like three months ago or something? Yep. I have never seen one man make a whole classroom of 60 people, 60 recal kids, just cry. <laughs> well, just, that wasn't what we were. We weren't that, trying yeah, to make people cry. Yeah. But that was an outcome on the day. People shared some real emotion, and yeah. that's positive. That was a, honestly the best that you couldn't you couldn't bring one of my idols. Well, okay, you couldn't bring like who's your idol? Have a while. Well, Probably. give me one idol. What? Uh, you got one idol? Possibly Steph Curry. Steph Curry. Yeah. One idol. Ooh. I like Denzel Washington. Denzel yeah. Washington. I like it. All right. Okay. That gives me a little bit more knowledge about both of you. They, if I saw Steph Curry, I'd be such so I'd be like, oh shit, Steph Curry. But like, I wouldn't, he wouldn't tell me a story where I'd just fall out in tears, you know? But you never know. You told me stories, you asked that, you engaged us in, you're like, what is your... Most treasured your, possession? Yes. Yes. What was it again? Mine was just memories. Memories? Yeah. And yours? Most treasured possession. What would you say? Memories too, yeah. Memories too? Yeah. Well, hard to go past them, isn't it? And this will be a memory for us exactly. and the audience, yes. something we can all remember. Yes. Fire away. I want your first question. Just spit it out. Why did you start with footy? Why footy? Why did I start with football? Yes. Wow. I spent probably, oh, I'd say five hours a day in the backyard throwing a tennis ball against one of those things, a brick wall, just for hours and hours and hours and hours. And all I wanted to be was a wicket keeper for yeah. Australia. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to play cricket, just wanted to be a wicket keeper. But unlike your good self, sir, I couldn't grow a moustache <laughs> to be like my, at the time, cricketing idol, Rod Marsh, had a big moustache, one as cool as that. Yeah. And I thought, you know what? I'm not really getting anywhere with cricket. It's a little bit boring. I'm gonna go and play baseball. And baseball for me was fantastic. And we were just talking off camera about a guy called Malcolm Gladwell. And he has shared a theory for many years that in order to be an expert at anything, you need to do 10,000 hours of practice. So 10,000 hours, hello sir. 10,000 hours of practice. It's always good to have external guests on your podcast. 10,000 hours of practice of any one thing making you an expert. Well, you wouldn't believe it, all those hours as a kid throwing that tennis ball against the wall meant that I was pretty much an expert at throwing balls. So by the time I reached 15, 16, I had a lot of skill in that space, being cricket slash baseball. So I was really enjoying that journey into baseball. But unfortunately, a big issue arose for me and that was I lost touch with myself. So I went from being a really gentle, creative, thoughtful human being to a really arrogant, indifferent asshole. Mm. And that led me to cutting my right arm in half. So I cut my right arm completely in half. And if you look at my hand here, I'm not sure if we'll pick up on the film there, on the camera, 
But on this particular hand, my right hand, I have no muscle left anymore. You'll see the definition in this hand, the muscle. I can't close my hand properly anymore. It's the best I can do and I can't feel part of my hand and my arm anymore because of the damage to the nerves in my arm. Yeah, yeah. So I self-sabotaged for no good reason. Yeah. I wasn't hit by my father or living in a uh, situation of poverty or uh, deprivation. I was just an indifferent, ordinary person for a short period of time, cut my arm in half, had to rebuild my life, had to rebuild my brain. And part of the rebuild was to step away from baseball and concentrate on football. Yeah. And I never thought I'd even be able to play football. In fact, a story that I didn't tell you was that my father actually came to me when I was 17 after this had happened. Yeah. And he said to me, your membership for the MCC so the Melbourne Cricket Ground, MCC, the member section, your memberships come through. What would you like to do about renewing it? Because it's a lot of money. It's hundreds of dollars. Yeah. I said, Dad, you know what? Give me that piece of paper. And I tore it up and I threw it in the bin. And he said to me, what are you doing? And I said, Dad, we're not renewing the membership. He said, are you crazy? I said, no, not at all. He goes, I put your name down for that before you were born. So you'd be on the waiting list. So we'd get you a membership at the MCG. I said, that's fine, Dad. I said, do you know that if I play over 200 games of AFL football, I get free tickets for the rest of my life anyway? Yeah. And my dad said, but you haven't, and he stopped. Yeah. He, I know what he was about to say. He was about to say, you haven't even played one game. Yeah. But he stopped and he said, all right, I'll back you. And as history would now show, I was lucky enough to play over 200 games. So yeah. free tickets for games for the rest That's of my life. motivational ass, man. So <laughs> sometimes you've got to back yourself. And in, in all seriousness, hustlers, what you're trying to do here, your podcast, one person, two, three, however many people listen and take this in, that's not your problem. Yeah. That's their problem. Yeah. That's their problem. If they can't enjoy even the first five minutes of our conversation here now, that's their problem. Yeah. Because this is real. Yeah, I agree. This is us, and this is two young people getting outside of their comfort zone, doing something special. I agree. Thank I think you. that's super positive. Thank you. You're welcome. That's Let's, question one. Yes. Were you happy with the answer to question one? I loved it. Loved yeah, it. There we go. I right. have been here for a second. Look at this. Do you want this man on camera? He loves a camera. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dive into 17 years Let's old. Let's do it. What are we wearing? Budgie smugglers? Yeah. <laughs> Do tell me honestly, you go to the pool, you go to a public pool, what sort of attire just, are you going to wear? I just wear shorts, that's it. Just short, footy shorts? Nah, nah just, no. just swimming shorts, yeah, yeah. beach shorts. With a design or just yeah, a plain colour? Yeah, like just a few designs on them. Yeah, okay, what would you, you'd wear footy shorts I reckon. For me, it starts off with footy shorts. Home or away? Whites? Look, or... I go, I go whites. I go You're going to go the white? I go my white Carlton shorts. You're going to go white Carlton shorts? Oh, yeah, but I, I wear my... My skins, my Nike skins under underneath. Yeah, Ooh, and then nice. I've got my my Kobe Bryant All Star jersey. And you're gonna wear that to the pool too. Yeah, no, but I, but then like once I get that wet, then I'm like, right, I, can't, I hate wearing a wet shirt. So I just take it off, yeah, throw it away. Abs out. Start my swim. Like yeah, abs I like out. it. It's good. Suns out, guns out. Suns out, guns out. Question two. Your arm. My how, arm. How did it happen? How? Well, it happened when flesh met this yeah that's... when flesh meets glass unfortunately it's not like the movies you don't just burst through a window and roll into the next scene and everything's okay there are shards of glass you land on glass glass cuts yeah and so i thrust my arm in a fit of rage towards a shop front window which yeah, it's a very similar thickness, probably a little bit thicker, to be honest, than this glass here. Yeah. And I shattered the glass because the three of us could easily shatter this glass. Yeah. But for me, it wasn't a case of the shattering and pretending to be this big hero. It was when I pulled my arm back out and a large shard of glass got caught on my elbow, yeah. cut it in half. So without sounding like a, a completely trite bastard, you do go from hero to zero yeah. in a hurry. And that happens to people all day, every day, male, female of varying ages. And it's a reflection on your ability to control your ego 
and control your thought process and control your environment. Yeah. There was no need for me to act the way I acted that particular night other than me trying to fulfill my own ego because I was the one who had a problem with the world around me. I have to take responsibility for that. Yeah. At the time, I could see it coming, but I couldn't understand what was coming. Yeah. And I think any young person, young people who are watching this, and for that matter, anyone in general has been in one of those situations where you think to yourself, you know what, I just got away with that, I just got away with that, I just got away with that. And when you start feeling that way about your performance, maybe it's schoolwork, maybe it's the way you're treating a family member, yeah. sooner or later, it's gonna hit you really, really hard. Yeah. And yeah. you will lose. And for me, that was a, a huge loss. And I was confronted by a doctor in the hospital whom I had never met before. I'd never met this man. Yeah. And he stood at the foot of the bed. He looked me dead in the eye. And he said to me in a thick English accent, you're a fake, you're a phony, you're a fraud. He said, it's gonna take hours to put your arm back together. Your job is to lie there in that hospital bed and think about what sort of human being you wish to be. Because I think you're an absolute joke. He then walked to the door. The nurse was drawing the curtain. He opened the door about six inches. And he said, do you see this doorknob? And I just nodded my head, nodded my head. He said, I'll just let you know, you'll never even turn the knob of a door again. Six hours to put your arm back together, but you need to get your head together because I think you're a right joke. Nurse, she drew the curtain, he shut the door, and the 17-year-old brat that I was was left alone in a hospital bed at would have been probably two or three in the morning, scratching my head thinking about what I am going to have to do to rebuild my life. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Mm. It's, it's touching, yeah. It's crazy. And I made some decisions that night that changed my entire life. And unlike some people who make mistakes, I am very good at acknowledging the mistake, thinking through the mistake, and coming up with plan A, B, C, D, anything to move forward and be more successful. Yeah, yeah. What's the best advice you've ever been given? The best advice I've ever been given? Yeah. I don't seek advice. I've never asked for advice. I observe everyone all the time. That's good. So yeah. going to one person and saying, give me an answer, what's that? But if I walk out the front door and every day I'm looking, I'm wondering, I'm thinking, I'm creating, I'm looking to engage, then I've got a world of advice. And so for me, for example, and this is a big deal to me. If I walk through a door, I want to hold it open for the next person. Yeah. That's how I live my life. So if I'm out somewhere and I see somebody do that, I think, mm, that's good. He or she did that. I've got to keep remembering to do that myself. Before I came here to be with you here today, I was at the running track training and a gentleman brought two little children down to the running track, maybe five, five years of age and he had them jumping into the long jump pit. And he just kept lying to them the whole time. That's a great jump, that's amazing, that's fantastic. And I loved it. Because what are you gonna to say to a little kid? Terrible jump, shitty, <laughs> that was horrible. Of course yeah. you're not. You're gonna praise them and lift them up and tell them they're doing something special and that they can improve on what they just did if they work a little bit harder. I loved it. And I thought to myself, that's exactly what I need to keep saying to myself with my running or my lifting or my health or my fitness. You know what? You're doing well. Keep going. Push harder. You can do better. Yeah. So just watching. You know, I'm a really keen observer of people. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to, I guess, organically acquire information yeah. and knowledge. Yeah. It's good. That sounds good, yeah. <laughs> we, um... We spoke the first time about Essendon versus Carlton, Carlton grand yeah. final. Yeah. Preliminary yes, final. Preliminary final. 
what happened that did that day well that was no nah, didn't change my life football hasn't changed my life like that in any way shape or form the football has changed my life behind the scenes but in terms of the game itself that hasn't changed my life that's not life changing stuff that's that's a game of sport yeah but that game that you're referring to which is the 1999 AFL preliminary final between Essendon and Carlton was just such a huge game uh, massive crowd huge intensity unbelievable rivalry and of course the week before I'd gone on television after the game against the West Coast Eagles and I dropped the F-bomb uh, on live television so I, I said after the game I was interviewed because it was my 150th game I think for Carlton I can't quite remember and I was asked about the week uh, coming against the Bombers and I said we need to go out there and stick it up the fucking Bombers and so <laughs> the room just went silent because back then you couldn't say that at all yeah. people just took that so seriously and I got into a fair bit of trouble for saying that uh, so that meant that there was a huge uh, amount of pressure on me too for that next game I ended up playing in the forward line that week yeah. I started in the forward line for that game and I actually kicked the first goal of the game. So I, to this day, I'm not sure if anyone made a lot of money on that. I'm not, I'm not a gambler. I'm not the sort, I've never put on a bet in my life uh, in any way, shape or form, but somebody would have got incredible odds for me to have kicked the first goal of that game. Yeah, yeah. So that's how that game started, and the game finished with me in the background, uh, background, well, kind of in the background. <laughs> I was in the background because I was watching a guy called Mark McCurry, who I'd played football with and against as a young footballer. Uh, we were now in the back line, he was a forward. I watched him with the ball, with a chance to kick a goal to essentially win the game for the Bombers, yeah. and I would have backed him to kick that nine out of 10 times. And as he, I remember it so clearly, when he went to kick the ball, I just remember going, oh no. And then when it missed, I <laughs> could not believe it. I was like, oh wow, like we're going to win this game. And so it, it was just an extraordinary game. It meant, meant a lot to a lot of people, uh, including myself. And it would probably go down as one of the, I would think, maybe the top five games ever played. Yeah. So to be out there and playing in a game like that and playing well is yeah. a really cool thing to have on your personal resume, if you like. Yeah. But uh, a football for me is an extraordinary sport and it's played a huge part in my life, but I've never allowed football to be my life. Yeah. And I think that's a huge mistake that anyone can make, whether you're a plumber, a mechanic, a teacher, whatever it happens to be. If that's all you are, it's a very narrow life. Yeah. You know, yeah. life's to be lived broadly and enjoyed broadly. I agree. What does the word leadership mean to you? You think of it, what is, <laughs> what is the meaning for it to you? I, I, I think in the context of what you're probably suggesting, I think it's a bullshit word because so many people are waiting for someone else to lead them and they haven't developed the ability to lead themselves. Yeah. So you need to be able to lead yourself and be your own leader long before you look for any leadership from anyone else. That's right. Yeah. And in terms of somebody else leading you, well then you need to have a strong understanding about who you are if you wish to lead other people. So we're all living, all of us are living in this COVID time and it's been terrible yeah. for all sorts of people, for all sorts of reasons. But if I said to you both, gentlemen, you must go home, you must stay in your home for two weeks, yeah. you're not allowed out, not for any reason, we'll deliver food to you, we will do this, we will do that. You wouldn't like it, I wouldn't like it, the audience wouldn't like it, but we could all at least go, right, I've been told there's some leadership, there's some structure, there are some boundaries, I know what I have to do and I trust in this person, yeah. the person telling me. In this day and age that we're living in, leadership, particularly political leadership, is so poor yeah. As young people, let alone myself, slightly older, a lot older, 
who do we turn to for leadership? Who do we believe in? Yeah. Scott Morrison? Does anyone watching this really believe in Scott Morrison? I mean, really believe in him. Yeah. Whereas he said, stay home for two weeks, do this. You, you wouldn't believe him. Yeah. Because he hasn't got any trust and investment in you as a person. It's yeah, not yeah. there anymore. So your question about leadership is a good one. A, it has to come from the individual themselves. Yeah. B, we're living in a really troubled time where the people that we're looking at for real leadership aren't there. Yeah. You know, don't even get me started on Donald Trump. <laughs> the guy is an absolute disgrace. Yeah, I agree. But think about this, and I say this to the camera and the two of you very, very clearly and without any uh, grandstanding or trying to make this something more than what it was, Think about this. This is a man, Donald Trump, who said that he can grab women by their private parts. Yeah. And he is now president? <laughs> yeah. Now that is a reflection, whether we like it or not, that's a reflection on all of us. All of us. Someone watching, well, I'm not from America, I'm not, I'm not in America. No, 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 you're not, neither am I. Yeah. But we all need to take responsibility for promoting fools to positions of power. Yeah. And that's been done through social media, mismanagement and misinformation of media. Yeah. And we all need to take responsibility for that. So my Instagram account, I've pulled it back, for example, to one post. There's never going to be another post on there, just one. Yeah. Because whether it's the two of you or the audience, I'm happy for you to contact me all day, every day, contact me, send me a message, ask a question. Yeah. But you don't need to see about my new car. Yeah. You don't need to see what I ate for dinner. Yeah. If you want to come to my house and have dinner, get on the message, send me a direct message. Yeah. And that's not bullshit. That's for real. That is for real. I had a gentleman in my house this afternoon in my lounge room whom I met on Gumtree. Gumtree. He's in my lounge room, we're chatting, we're talking. I trust him, I like him. Are we going to be best friends? Probably not, yeah. because that's just not where our lives are at. But would I rather him spend some time in my lounge room and have a conversation with me in the real world than do some bullshit on Instagram where I've posted a picture of my new car? Like, fuck yeah. that. Yeah. That's not leadership. Yeah. That's not leadership. That's not developing any culture, any uh, human trait that's yeah. just grandstanding and pumping up your own tires mm -hmm. it's a waste of time so what you're doing this hustlers podcast it's a form of leadership hopefully some other young people see it and say you know what i like what they're doing i might get involved too i might yeah. do my own podcast or i might go and do this or i might go and do that so yeah. there are many scales of leadership and obviously uh, many levels in terms of who can participate but if you're not participating every day as a leader, yeah. we end up, as I said, voting in idiots like Donald Trump. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Has this man got any yeah. questions? Yeah, any questions? I've been, I'll You've hogged all the questions. All right, I've got right. right. what, what advice can you tell people to um, cope with all this coronavirus and all that and the isolations? It's very, very difficult. It's a very, very tough question. I haven't worked since March the 16th yeah. and I've been very, very disappointed about that because I love what I do. I love who I work with in terms of young people. I love being able to share and help those people develop as human beings. I've got no way forward in terms of my work. I can't change the rules. I can't have 300, 400, 500 people in a room to suit my own ego. So in these sorts of situations, and I've been in them many times, and I'm talking about situations of crisis, mm. the number one thing you have to do is come back to zero. So I took myself back to zero, and that means that you're just sitting down and you're thinking, what's the landscape look like for me? I've got 24 hours in a day, and this is exactly what I do. I need to get eight hours sleep. Doesn't always work out that way, but I need to get eight hours sleep. Yeah. Yeah. I need to eat well, I've got a choice. I sit at home eating junk food because I'm in coronavirus or I keep eating well, yeah. okay, I'm gonna eat well. I've got more time on my hands so I can train even a little bit more and a little bit more intensely than I was. Okay, sleep, eat, train. Okay, 
how my relationships looking first relationship is with myself how am i feeling about myself what do i need to do to make myself feel good each day yeah. how am i relating to my family my friends who am i contacting why am i contacting them am i contacting them to have a sook or a whinge or a wine or am i contacting them to have a positive conversation yeah. do i want to surround myself with those negative energies or positive energies. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about waving fish above my head and chanting 10 times. Yeah. I'm just talking about doing basic things very, very well. Yeah. And if you're doing those basic things very, very well, all of a sudden you're eight hours of sleep, you've done some training for the day, you've contacted some friends, you're pulling the time down that's free to a level which is more manageable rather than sitting there going, I'm bored, I can't do this, I'm gonna eat yeah. this hamburger, I'm gonna have these chips, whatever. You know, again, what you're doing here today, what your viewers and your listeners have a chance to do is work on the same theory. I've got some time here, how will I invest that time? Yeah, that's right, man, yeah. And don't get me wrong, every day you can't be some sort of perfect performance, every day you can't invest it perfectly, but I still keep an old school diary I'm not yeah. sure if you do, but I like to open it up every day and I like to see, right, this is what I'm doing today, this is how I'm doing it, these are the things I'm looking at in this next little period of time, okay, that's next week. What I... So I can tell you, this weekend, as an example of something that your, again, your viewership, your listenership mightn't be able to quite get their head around, but it's so important, this weekend, I need to really cut loose. Yeah. I need to have a weekend full of music. I need to have a weekend full of friends. Can I have 20 people at my house this weekend? No, I can't. Yeah. But I can invite a couple of friends around, you know, family, whoever it may be, have something nice to eat, listen to some music, all this sort of stuff, because you can't just keep trying to hit the red line all the time. You need to be able to back it off too. Yeah. Mm. Maybe that means sitting and reading a book. Maybe that means sitting, listening to a podcast. Mm. But hustlers... Hustlers can't hustle 24 seven. If you yeah. do, you just run out of energy and you start making dumb mistakes. Yeah. But if you, you get your hustle on, you work hard at something, then you pull back a little bit and say, I need a little bit of time for myself now. You gotta balance yeah. it out. Yeah. Balance it out, absolutely. And that's such a key each and every day and everyone balances things differently. For me, my balance comes through my fitness, yeah. my music and my writing. Mm. They're the three areas that I use to balance my life. The most important one for me is, is probably my fitness. Probably, I say probably because it's neck and neck with music. My writing is probably the next tier down. Without music, without fitness, I don't know where I'd be. I'd probably be dead. Yeah. Who's your, who's your go-to artist to listen to? What's your go-to music? Wow, my personal playlist has probably close to 750 hand-picked tracks, uh, tracks that mean a lot to me. Yeah. Uh, there's everything on there from, in fact, I can, I can tell you because I remember I downloaded it yesterday and added it to uh, my playlist, it's some old Snoop Dogg. Yeah. So I, I love old school hip hop, yeah. Yeah. but I also love electronic music, which is really, really weird because during the 90s, when electronic music really started to get a stronghold, I really pushed away from it very hard yeah. and concentrated on other forms of music and artists that I grew up listening to, things like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, this sort of stuff. Uh, but in the last maybe 10 years, I really turned back to electronic music yeah. and there's some tracks that I just love listening to. Um, I'll, I'll love listening to them doing the dishes quite sincerely like I'll, I'll have the I'll have the stereo absolutely cranking yeah. <laughs> listening to this music and it's a really nice thing to understand that you actually you actually love something yeah. it actually means something to you greatly and for me that's that's a really beautiful feeling because it gives you a a sense of, I guess, a solidity in your head that this is something worth pursuing for me. Yeah. So there are many things in my life, and I'm sure yours, that you think you like or you think you're passionate about, but then when they're not there, you're like, 
so what? It didn't, didn't really matter. I wasn't really that into that. But music, and in particular a certain selection of songs, I mean, I've probably got 30 or 40 songs, which I'm just so grateful to have had in my life. Like, yeah. I'm so grateful. There's a track that you're, again, your audience can take in by a DJ called Willaris K. Yeah. And his song's called Five O'Clock. And it's, it's sadly brief. I wish it was a little longer. But this is a song completely devoid of lyrics. But the emotion that that song builds in me is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Just even thinking about it now, I'm like, oh man, I am so grateful to have come across this song. I'll, I'll listen to that song when I'm 100. Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite song? Oh, it's such a great question and we could literally sit here for hours and discuss it. Yeah. Uh, I, I've just finished putting together a playlist of 17 significant songs uh, from my life and from my experiences. Yeah. Um, everything from Lenny Kravitz's uh, song, My Precious Love, which was significant for me when my girlfriend at the time had an abortion. Yeah. Uh, and that broke my heart. Uh, a song by the Red Hot Chili Peppers called Knock Me Down, which again was significant at the time because one of the lyrics in that particular song is, if you see me getting mighty, if you see me getting high, knock me down. Yeah. And it was written by Anthony Kiyos for Hillel Slovak, who was the lead guitarist who died of a heroin overdose. And that applied for the time when I cut my arm in half. Yeah. Uh, right at the moment, I've been actually listening to a fair bit of Public Enemy. Yeah. and Fight the Power, which is an incredible song from the soundtrack it of is, yeah. Spike Lee's movie, Do the Right Thing. I remember being probably 16, I think it was released in 1989, that movie. I remember going to see that movie and feeling so uh, violently uh, focused on wanting to see uh, racial equality. Uh, and unfortunately, here we are in 2020, the world really hasn't improved that much at all, which yeah. is really, really sad. And if anyone has a chance to watch that movie, it is an incredible movie. It almost illustrates everything that the world's going through today. Yeah. Uh, well worth you know, an hour and a half of your time. One of my favorite movies of all time. So I have these songs that have played a, a role in my life and as I said provide a soundtrack to who I am and what I've experienced to choose one favorite really 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 tough uh, again I, I used to do a lot of DJing stuff on radio and one thing that people would always call in and say how can you have that song with that song and that song and that song and they'd be like you know what who gives a shit yeah. mm. <laughs> I'm playing tracks they don't all have to be electronic. They don't all have to be hip hop. Yeah. They don't all have to be hard rock. Yeah. There's lots to enjoy right across the board here. And that's, that's right. what I'd enjoy doing with my time on radio is I would play a whole mixed bag because I just grew up enjoying all these different types of artists. I mean, one of my favorite artists, I mean, I could probably fall down this rabbit hole for an hour, but. <laughs> If I could go back in time and see one artist or two or three, definitely one artist that I would like to see at the top of his career or their career, if you like, is Eric B and Rakim. If I could go back and see Eric B and Rakim yeah. spit somewhere in uh, you know New York or whatever it happened to be, yeah, somewhere really cool, be, yeah. I would be in heaven. That would be <laughs> awesome. Me personally, I love J. Cole. Yeah. Um, he, it's because... Cop some heat lately, hasn't he? Yeah, because of that latest song, because I don't even know. It's, just, it's cancel culture. I don't like all that. It's just people who aren't happy. I don't get the feeling that J. Cole's a bad person. Me neither. Mm. It's just people that want him to be a bad person. Mm. It's hard. It's a really uh, hard time. Yeah. It's a hard time for you. It's a hard time for your audience. Yeah. You know, the mobile phone, cameras, all this sort of stuff amplifies everything. And it's, it's good that we're talking about J. Cole right now because I, I didn't investigate. I did see that he was um, copping some heat. Yeah. But I just didn't think from what I've seen of J. Cole that he probably deserved it. But yeah. 
it's a tough world. Yeah. Have um, you ever copped some heat? I have. Yeah. Because just from parents or beyond? Beyond, but like not beyond, beyond like cops heat, like that heat, like. We're not going to have to run away and no, save no. ourselves now, <laughs> no. are we? We are in foot scrub. I, uh, my parents went away one night and then I was like to him, I was like, should I just have a party at my house? Of like, course, you, good of course you do. Yeah. So then, um, and this was like, I had like three hours preparing time. It was from five o'clock I said, I called him, I'm like, come to my house, I'm going to invite people. I originally intended to invite five, ten people. Not How many? Anything. How much? 30 people like rocked up? 50, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, well, shit. And then I've got these lemon trees and then people, they were playing tennis on my tennis court and people are getting lemons from the lemon trees because they keep hitting the balls over. And then I wake up in the morning to go clean up. There's juice from the lemons everywhere on the court. I'm like, shit, I don't even know how to use a pressure washer to clean it off. So I was like, let me just deal with the consequences of what my parents And did they find out that you'd had a party? Yeah, because um, I can't say obviously who or what, but yeah, I um, called, how much, I ordered eight pizzas and three garlic breads that night. And then- Don't forget the garlic breads. Yeah, and then two hours, no, no, two minutes later, um, I get a call and I thought it was the pizza place. I'm like, the pizzas are here already? And they're like, what pizzas? I'm like, the eight pizzas and three garlic breads. And my mom's like, you ordered eight pizzas and three garlic breads? I'm like, oh. Big trouble. Yeah. Oh, you sold yourself out. Yeah, I sold Whoops. myself out. Look out. Yeah. And um, that's probably the most heat I've been in. Heat? Never copped it? I've been pretty responsible. Yeah. Really, so. like it must be the mustache. <laughs> it is. It makes you wise. It makes you very wise. I like it. Talk to me, gentlemen. Talk to me. Next question. Alec Epples. Mm hmm. What does he mean to you? How does how is he affected you in any way? Well, he's, effect, he's affected me in every way. So this is a man that I met at random at the 1993 AFL Grand Final. Long story short, he said to me to give him a call and uh, remember this is at random, never met this person before. Give him a call if I wanted to be a better footballer and a better person. Mm. I ended up calling him. He told me that the first Wednesday after that grand final, so Saturday AFL Grand Final, first Wednesday to meet at the bottom of Park Street, Clorinda Reserve at 7 a.m. Mooney Ponds, that is. I turn up at 7.15. I walk into the park with swag. Swag hadn't even been invented. This old man, this old Italian man, Alec Epis, goes absolutely fucking crazy at me. <laughs> crazy crazy shit like going mad chest to chest he's spitting on me he's swearing at me and he basically says if you're ever late again never come back yeah. and i can promise you and your viewers and your listeners that i thought to myself i never want to go back <laughs> this guy's fucking crazy yeah. i don't want to go back he's nuts he's not a good person he's a lunatic he's not the sort of person I want to associate with. Yes, I was late, but man, you didn't have to react like that. It was crazy shit. Yeah. Anyway, he trained me for two hours, and at the end of that two hours, I basically couldn't walk. So it was football training for two hours, and I dragged myself back to my car, and I promised myself I would never spend another second with this man. Yeah. But as it turns out, I went back the week after, and I went back the week after that, and the week after that. In fact, I ended up going back every Wednesday morning to meet this man at the bottom of Park Street, Clorinda Reserve, it's called Clorinda Park actually yeah. now, Mooney Ponds at 7 a.m. for the next nine years. Yeah. Nine years we met there every Wednesday morning. And he taught me to be a better footballer, he taught me to be a better person, and he essentially became my second father. Yeah. So he's turning 83 later this year. Uh, I love him as much as I could possibly love any human being. Yeah. Oh, it's a lie. I might just love my children a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. He might be, have a little bit more extra love for your children, but he's been such an incredible part of my life that I do have that extraordinary amount of love for him as a person. Yeah. And he has listened to me. He's never put me down. He's always supported me. He's told me tough things. Yeah. 
He hasn't told me everything that I wanted to hear. He hasn't told me that I'm right, but he's been very fair and honest and supportive and loving and caring in his own way. He's, he's pretty tough, Yeah, but that's okay. But the funny thing about what he has done for me in terms of football and in terms of life is that my experience with him when coupled with my degrees, when coupled with my experience on stage, when coupled with my media background has allowed me to work with young people yeah. in a more cohesive and productive manner. So he has given me skills which I've been able to use in my own style, in my own way with young people. So he has helped enormously in terms of what you would see of my life, but behind the scenes, yeah like that iceberg, iceberg theory you're only seeing 10% of it the other 90% that's where he's done an yeah. enormous amount of work so I would be lost without him and it was only only about three months ago that he was in intensive care mm. he's in intensive care for a number of weeks I thought he was going to die and uh, he managed to pull through goodness me I have no idea how he pulled through I really don't on my phone I have a picture of me holding his hand one night where I'd kissed him and, and said goodbye. He was basically in a coma. And uh, I thought, this is it. But yeah. then <laughs> the next day and the day after that and the day after that and so forth, he just kept getting better. So he's a really stubborn old bastard. Yeah. And he's a really incredible human being. He's doing good now? He's doing better. I mean, as I said, he's turning 83. He's gone through an awful lot. So it's, it's a bit like you, know, you run a marathon, you don't just get ready to run another marathon. Yeah, You're gonna need yeah. time to recover and build yourself up again yeah. uh, before you're allowed to, I guess, even think about running a marathon. So he is, he's right back at the starter's blocks. Yeah. He's, he's probably not gonna run a mar another marathon, with, but knowing him, he'll try to run at least a 100 meter sprint. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that tough love works? It does when it's sincere. Yeah, when it's sincere, if, if you know that I love you and that I care for you and what I'm saying is directed at making you better, that has actually nothing to do with me, it's not about my ego, then I think definitely some tough love works. Do you need to be tough and aggressive and you know, demanding of someone all the time to get the best out of them? No, not at all. But I think there has to be a line in the sand in any relationship that if you step over it, yeah, you're, you're going to wear one, yeah. however that is. You know, maybe it's a clip over the head. Maybe it's just a little bit of a cold shoulder. I, I have unbelievable relationships with young people right across this country and, and beyond. But if anyone wants to take me for granted and not show me respect or disrespect themselves, I'm out. Yeah. I haven't got time for that bullshit. Yeah. You know, I'm here with you two today, investing my time in you You've been nothing but polite, respectful, caring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. You, know, you spoke. You, you actually said, "How much? How much do I need to get paid for today?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, like what the fuck? I there's no money. This this is not about money. Yeah. Like you you give me a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars to be here today. Well, what what's that? This is about seeing two young people and someone who couldn't be here because of sack drama. Yeah. <laughs> so your third hustler couldn't be here. Yeah. <laughs> but seeing some young people trying to do something positive. So why do I need to capitalize on that? I don't need to capitalize on that. I need to help these two young people move forward. And if this can help in some small way or shape, then that's a positive. But to, to think you're gonna take some money uh, to do this sort of thing. Ali Kepis never took one cent. Not one cent. Mm. Yeah. He, he, 10,000 hours, he's, he's given up 10,000 hours to me. Yeah. I met him in 93, it's 2020. <laughs> it's 27 years. Yeah. He's given up more than 10,000 hours. Not one cent, never. So how could I think to take? But my rule is if I've got two people who are being absolutely dedicated and genuine, and this person here is letting themselves down or uh, being half-assed or inconsistent, then yeah. I'm going to give them a chance. I'll always give someone a chance, yeah. but if they're not going to lift their efforts, 
sorry, I've got people here who need my time, who want my time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so unfortunately, I've had to let some young people go, particularly young people who are focused on drug use. Yeah. But if you're gonna choose heroin, for example, over love and friendship, it's incredibly sad, but that's your choice. Yeah. I used to have a period of time where I wanted to try and carry around everyone on my back and protect everyone. Mm. Yeah. But I got hurt really, really badly doing that. And so I decided in order to move forward, I had to put a line in the sand and say to people, hey, this is how we play the game, at least in my world. If you want to play the game with me, more than happy to help. Yeah. If not, you're going to have to do your own thing. Yeah. How are we going? You all right? Yeah. A few I'm... deep breaths. You're... <gasps> <gasps> we... Um... This is from Jared. Shout out to Jared. Obviously, he's going to watch this. Pack. I got Colin Pack. Respect. Um, we're doing. Well, he's the teacher. Yeah, yeah. He's our my VCAL teacher, my VCAL coordinator. He um, asked me today because we're currently on community issues and all that, community everything. Um, what does helping the community and doing all that to, for the community mean to you? Mm, easy, easy answer, quick answer. As I said before, it's about doing little things. Yeah. Little things. Yeah. You don't have to go out and do incredibly diverse and colourful and expensive things. Just little things every day. Uh, I think a lot of young people are particularly good at this, but I think a lot of people probably over the age of 40, as I am, absolutely suck at it. Yeah. Let me give you an example. When you are driving your car in a perfect world and you come to a pedestrian crossing, yeah. the deal is you stop. True? You yeah. stop. You let the person walk past. Yeah. What's really nice is if that person looks at you and just goes like that. Just goes like that. You look at them again like that. They walk past, you keep driving. Yeah. I find that a lot of young people, when they do that, they look at me and they go like that. Fantastic, makes me feel good, they should feel good. I stop, they're safe. Nice way of making the community roll forward. I find that a lot of people over the age of 40 in particular, don't even look at you. Yeah. Now, do, yeah. They, do they have to? No, there's no law there saying that you have to yeah. acknowledge the person but it's just a nice thing to do. Yeah. And if you give a shit about your community and the people in it, yeah. that's a nice way to act towards another human being. Yeah. Thanks. Give same with boost. Same with holding the door open. Oh, there's somebody, hold the door open. Even saying hello to someone. Yeah. You know, we all have those little conversations where you say hello to them, kind of like, hello, hello, hey, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Yeah. They're good. They're good conversations to have. Yeah. Even better when you're saying hello to somebody who doesn't look like you. Rather than walk past someone in the street and ignore them, oh God, that person looks different to me. They're not the same religion or the same race. Say hello. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Yeah, good man. Keep walking. Yeah. That's good. They're good things to do in the community. Mm. You don't have to do something incredibly magical. You don't have to post it on Instagram. Yeah. I must admit, I've got some messages, DMs of late saying, why aren't you talking about this? Why aren't you doing this? And I just write back saying, listen, you don't have a fucking clue what I'm doing. Yeah. You have no idea. I could go out and pick up rubbish for five hours and put it in my car and go and dispose of it at the tip and make my whole end of my street cleaner and better. Do I need to put that on Instagram? Do I need to go, yeah, look what I did? Not at all. Like bushfires, COVID, you know, Black Lives Matter, all these things, they're, they're all very, very important. Yeah. But don't think, don't think that you have to do something incredibly dramatic with money yeah. or clout, look what I'm doing. It's just about your time. Mm. So you think about the bushfires, it seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. ages. But it's only a few months. Mm. So what happens once we can really start traveling freely, instead of you donating $500 and all this sort of stuff, 
uh, you know, three or four months ago to bush, you might decide to travel into that community in a month or so mm. and go and have dinner at the local restaurant, stay at the local hotel. And all that money goes into the community to the people who need it. Yeah. Think about this COVID times. You might know old Mrs. Smith or Mr. Brown down the street. You might go and knock on the door. Can I go to the supermarket for you? Can I bring you some milk? Can I get you a paper? And don't even start me on Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Because this is a conversation we shouldn't even be having. We should all already appreciate the importance of equality for everyone. Yeah. But if you're walking past someone in the street who's different to you and you can't even make eye contact and say hello, well, maybe you need to step out of your comfort zone and say hello. Yeah. Just at the running track today, and, you, and again, anyone watching this can contact me, you can spend a day with me, I don't care, you're always welcome, you won't be intruding. At the running track today, to, um, I, I know they're Muslim for sure, but I'm not sure where they're from. I think they might be from uh, the Middle East, I'm not entirely sure, but two Muslim people have been working their uh, fitness and health around the running track in Newport where I train, and every time I see them, including today, I make a point of saying hello to them. Yeah. Just so they feel comfortable. Because, you know, here's this weird dude. Maybe I look really weird to them. I don't know. Yeah. But we've seen each other now three or four times. And today when they see me, they smile. Yeah. So about changing community, little consistent positive actions. And again, yeah. this is where our leadership falls down because... It's all about some money or some power. Just do things because you care enough to do them. Yeah, I agree. You, you want to talk? Oh, no, you want to ask questions? I've asked this. You go. <laughs> Come on, hustlers. What have I you got for me? I went blank. Um, what do you regret the most in your football career? In my football career? Not a lot. Not a lot. Nah, nah. I don't... In my football career, nah, nothing. I don't regret anything. Do you have any regrets in oh, outside I've, of it? I've got a shitload of regrets outside of football. Yeah. Uh, I've screwed up things massively on all sorts of occasions. And I, I really regret certain things that I've said and done. I, I can't take them back. I've made mistakes. Yeah. And some of them haunt me to these day, uh, to this day, I should say. Uh, but my football career, yeah, and, uh, I, uh, the only thing I could possibly say I regret is that I, I probably dumbed myself down in terms of my personality uh, to a level which uh, I probably could have been more. This is going to sound strange, more honest about who I was. Yeah. But we're talking about a space, AFL football, which is so rigid, especially when I played, and so conservative, that they struggled with who I was already. Yeah. Yeah. So if I had have turned up with all of this, which is me, yeah. I probably wouldn't have even got a game. So it's, it's, it's challenging, particularly for those people who are around us who have multiple skills in multiple spaces and it's just not a straight line for them. They don't necessarily fit inside any box and I'm that sort of person. Yeah. So again, maybe to bring us full circle here back to our music conversation, I remember clearly, and I do have this piece of paper at home and you two and many of the people enjoying this podcast would have probably come across this phenomenon too. The classic one pager when you're applying for a team or maybe you're going to a certain space, a class, a club, and they ask you to fill out a profile yeah. piece. And I remember I was given one of these profile pieces when I was a junior looking to play for Victoria. Name, age, blah, 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 favorite food. And then it had a small little box for music. Yeah. I filled that box and then I filled the back of the piece of paper with bands that I was listening to, all sorts of bands, Dead Kennedy, Sex Pistols, Dead Milkman, all these sorts of wild bands that I was listening to back then. Yeah. And I remember a lot of my teammates, because this was something that was photocopied and handed out to everyone, 
a lot of my teammates were like, oh man, who the hell are you? Like, who listens to this? Everyone's listening to just Jimmy Barnes and Roxette and, you know, Duran Duran. And I'm listening to all these wild things. Duran Duran, one of my favorites, mind you. I'm listening to all these things. And so you know that the powers that be, especially in those spaces, are so conservative that they look upon that and they're like, who's this person? Yeah. We need to make sure that they are kept in line. Yeah. And I mean, you are a perfect example. You know, the beanie, the mo, the bracelet, all this sort of stuff. I couldn't give a shit. I, yeah. I see you. You know, even yourself. You, you know, you got the off whites and all this sort of stuff. I don't care. I'm not looking at that. Yeah. It's not what I'm engaging with. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm attracted to that. I <laughs> under, I understand what you're wearing and how you're wearing it, and you know, you look great. But I'm not attracted to that part of your person in a way to say, you know what, I need to push them down to make myself feel safe. Yeah. I'm yeah. not interested in that. I want to see more. I want to see who you are. Yeah. I, I don't want to push you down to make myself feel like I'm the boss and I'm in charge. But unfortunately, with the world that we live in and particularly sports, it seems like it's very free and it's very easy Sometimes you just have to know how far you can go. Yeah. Yeah. And let's be honest, again, going back to an earlier conversation we had, me dropping the F-bomb in a moment after a game of sport when a microphone's thrust in your face, not really the end of the world. Yeah. Especially when there's literature and movies and everything else, television programs on every night of the week with poor language, deliberately poor language. Yeah but it's a conservative space. So for me today, I've been more uh, liberal with my language. Yeah. I've spoken how I like to speak, but if I speak at a school, I can't really speak this way. Yeah, it's yeah. a shame because you two can tell me otherwise, your audience can tell me otherwise. I feel like the way I've spoken today to you here is how people speak in the real world. I agree, and that's, right, that's yeah. what I want. But unfortunately, sometimes the real world can't cope with the truth. Yeah. So, yeah, true, yeah. I, I'm not going to show you now, but I just got this huge tattoos done on my stomach yesterday. Yeah. yeah. If I had have done that when I was playing AFL football, they would have fallen off their <laughs> perch. They would have freaked out. Yeah. But really, whose business is that? It's mine. Yeah. It's my business. If I want to go and tattoo my stomach, that's my choice. It doesn't affect the way I play football. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, unfortunately, again, a lot of young people are unprepared for the systems and the mechanisms of the real world. Yeah. And there are certainly systems and mechanisms. So, speaking of tattoos... Mm -hmm. got a lot which one what was your first tattoo ever that you ever my got? first tattoos were on my feet yeah i had a dream that i got my feet tattooed and i thought if i keep having this dream i'll go and get my feet tattooed and so yeah. i got my feet tattooed and from there i mean you can probably i'm well, just pulling on the microphone but you can see this massive i've got a massive fox here and, and two yeah. oni masks on my stomach now um which i just got tattooed not yesterday the day before so less than 48 hours ago. Yeah. Uh, I never thought I'd get tattooed. I really didn't. I didn't grow up with a, a father or for that matter, a mother who was tattooed. Yeah. I didn't think at any stage that I would be, well, goodness me, my maths isn't good, but you know, I'm probably running it, I must be running it at about 60, 70% of my body now tattooed. Yeah. That's a lot. I would never have thought that would be the case. I would never have thought that my own children have tattoos yeah, yeah. so my middle son my eldest son got a tattoo for his birthday his 18th <laughs> my middle son got a huge big chest piece tattoo for his 18th birthday yeah. so i never thought i'd have tattoos i never thought i'd be a parent taking my kid to go and get <laughs> tattoos but yeah yeah you've just got to be who you are yeah. and and be happy with that what's your favorite tattoo that tattoo i i think this big fox on my chest fox has played a, a huge part in my life and this piece i can't wait till it's finished so i think we made a date in july to continue that yeah 
but uh, the recent tattoo session of these Oni masks, it's quite an extraordinary experience for those people who haven't been tattooed. If you're getting tattooed properly, and I say properly in the sense that it's not just something that you're doing to fill in time, it's, doing, it's something that means a lot to you, and all of my tattoos are very, very important to me. But when you're really engaged with that space, for me, it was two hours of just zoning out and believe it or not, enjoying the pain. Yeah. It sounds strange, but just to enjoy that pain and appreciate it for what it is. Uh, getting a tattoo isn't a walk in the park. Yeah. It can be dramatically painful at times, but it's funny, I, I really concentrated on my breath and yeah. being relaxed and just enjoying, as I said, the experience. And before you know it, you know, all of a sudden you've got your stomach tattooed. <laughs> That's right, man. I've got a question. Um, Go for it. You say like, you gotta find out who you are. How do, how do you find out your identity? Number one, you've got to want to. You've actually got to want to. You actually have to give a shit to think, you know what? One of the most important things I can do is figure out who I am. Now, I don't know about either of you, but I can't think of too many more important things. So if you want to figure out who you are by drinking a six pack of beer, you're going to fail. If you want to figure out who you are by smoking a bong, you're going to fail. Mm. By trying to get a lot of money, you're going to fail. It's all just failure unless you've got the ability to figure out who you are in a quiet room, on your own, especially when the shits hit the fan. Mm. Who am I? What am I going to do? How am I going to move forward? What do I want to be remembered for? What do I want to be known for? Yeah. How do I want to treat other people? Like there's a list of literally thousands of things as to how you want to be. And yeah. some people don't want to recognize those things. Oh, yeah, whatever. Oh, it doesn't matter. I don't care. That's fine. The last thing I want to do is tell you or anyone else how to live their life. You go and do whatever the fuck it is that you want to do. It's your life. But where I'm concerned, where my life is, I want to make sure that all the benchmarks, all the standards, all the things that I believe make up who I am and they are always being refined. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't wake up at 1am 1, 1 on a Thursday night when I was 20 and go, right, this is the answer and this is going to be perfect. Not at all. I'm trying to refine who I am all the time. I'm trying to better myself all the time and not better myself in the sense of I ran 20 seconds for this distance and tomorrow I'm going to run five seconds and it doesn't work that way. Yeah. The next day you might run 19 seconds, the next day you might be back to 20. So I'm not trying to do these incredible jumps in my life, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm just trying to reach a point because this is what I believe that when I die and I, I believe this so strongly. I believe that before you die, I've thought about this over and over and over and over and over again, that there will be a moment where you can reflect upon your life. Now, someone might, watching might say, oh, what if you have a car accident? I haven't been there. It's just my belief that you will still have that moment. It could be a split second. Even right now, I can have it. I can say, am I happy with where my life's at? Yes or no? Bang. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is reach that point in my life and be able to answer yes. I was happy with what I did. Was I perfect? No. Was I the best? No. Did I make mistakes? Yes. Blah, blah, blah. But was I giving it everything I had? Yeah, yeah. I was giving it everything I had. Every single day, not just when it suited me, when it didn't suit me. Yeah. I was still busting my ass trying to do well. Again, did I say the right things or do the right things every day? No, I didn't. Make mistakes, that's okay. But I need to look at who I am and these mistakes that I'm making. And you know, if you two came over and I cooked you dinner and I screwed up the dinner, that's not something that I'm gonna fall in the corner and cry about. I'm gonna be embarrassed. I'm going to be disappointed. I'm sorry I didn't cook you a yeah. very good dinner. But that's not something to get so anxious and stressed about. 
But if my friends contact me saying, you know what, I'm struggling, can you come around and help me? And I'm like, oh, sorry, man, I can't do it. We'll speak later. Well, that's something I'm going to reflect upon and go, that, that was very, very poor. I wasn't there for my friends. Yeah. Or if I saw the two of you, you know, hurting yourself in some way, shape or form, it doesn't matter, I'll just let it go. No. Yeah. You know, again, going back to our Black Lives Matter, one of the biggest issues there is the bystanders. Yeah. I'm not a bystander. I know how dangerous it is in those situations, particularly in America with police acting the way they acted. There's no way I would have just stood there and watched that shit. Mm. No way. I don't care if it's a black man, an Asian man, you know, whatever it happens to be, I, I would have been involved in a more dramatic fashion. Yeah. But again, in this day and age, you have to continually fight for that decision as to whether you want to actually take action or not. Yeah. And I can't think of anything more important to take action about than who you are. Mm. I must know who I am. That's good. That's good. I'm glad you've I given that like stamp it. of approval. Yeah, I like that. Really That's good. Much. I like that, yeah. Now, let me give you the bad news. The bad news is that in my mind, and we've got our camo over there, mm. I reckon we're at over an hour, aren't we? We're about an hour and five. Jeez. Hour and five. All right? So your viewers, your listeners are there, I hope, suitably impressed. Hopefully. But they're looking for the final question, the final conversation, the nail That's to finish us off. Well, Where do you want to finish it? It has to it? be big, obviously, final question. Well, it doesn't have to be big. It could be small. It could be just something very subtle, very simple. Okay. Well, go into what you're doing now. You retire from footy. Mm-hmm. I'm old. What did you do? Why did you do what you do? Like, why? Why do I speak? Yes. So I was teaching when I was playing football. And you've heard the story about Alec. So Alec, the kookaburra, my teaching, I've always done all sorts of performance stuff on stage or otherwise. So I've had my own shows in the comedy festival. I was contracted to Channel 9. You've heard about some of the other media that I've done. All of this put me in a position where I had to make a decision. Do I wish to keep going down the media pathway or do I wish to get involved in some pure public speaking, so to speak? Yeah. And I chose to speak in public because I can directly impact and influence. I can't change particularly young people's lives. Yeah. So I've been doing it for over 20 years and it's changed over that period of time. And it's reached a point now where I am very, very confident in my product and how I put it across to a group of young people. I'm not demonstrative, I'm not prescriptive, I'm not there to put anyone down, I'm there to listen. I've done a lot of talking here today, but in those environments, I'm there to listen. Yeah. I'm there to help moving forward. And that's why my Instagram account, again, is essentially an investment for the audience. Yeah. You know what, I'm gonna follow this guy, not because he's gonna post anything more, he, he's not, he's telling me this is it, he's not posting anything more. Yeah. But I know that if I send him a message, or if I ask to see him in the real world, he'll be there for me. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty good asset to have as a young person, yeah. to have this person, this different sort of a guy, oh, stuff's not working with my mum or my, my siblings or my family, I've actually got this guy on Instagram. I could message him. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty good asset, as I said, for young people to have. So I chose to build a life around working with young people. So I have my own charity, which works predominantly with young people in prison. So whether it's my teaching, my charity work, or my speaking, it's all coming back to youth. Yeah. And the major reason why I do this, why I want to live my life this way, is because people have helped me. Mm. As trite and as lame as that sounds, lame as that sounds, it's the truth. And I do think it's a really wonderful thing, and we, again, we talked about community earlier, it's a wonderful thing when someone does something positive for you, when you say, you know what, I'm gonna do something positive for someone else now. Mm. And that doesn't have to be something special, it can just be something so, subtle so yeah. s seemingly small yeah. but imagine if someone 
taking this in said, you know what, I do know a Mrs. Brown or a Mr. Smith, and I am going to go and knock on their door, and I am going to ask them if they need any groceries. Yeah. That would be super cool. That would be super cool. And that's the sort of shit that has to go down every day if we're going to wrestle this world back from the likes of Donald Trump. Yeah. Shit has to change. And I'm hoping that this podcast helps things change. I agree. Well, that's all we've got for this podcast. Again, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Glenn Manton. Thank you so much for coming on today. It's a pleasure. It means a lot. Um, that's it. Bye. Ciao. Oh, that, that was an hour? It's an hour, my friend. <laughs>